correct. It's correct. It's correct. Ben, there's more words to the song than Like a Fool, by the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's like, da-da-da-da-da, woo, oh yeah. That's some of the other words. Fans are told me, okay? I love it. Ben mumbles and it just goes, Like a Fool. <laughs> fans, Mick, fans are told me. Ben, the real words are, da 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 then the bass. Shout out to the Curls. We love that band. Go check out the album Bounce House. Plenty more awesome tracks where that came from. Ben owns uh, the entire Curls collection. Isn't that right, Ben? Oh, that is correct. Tell us your favorite, uh, besides Like a Fool, what's your favorite Curls song? Uh, the other one. <laughs> the other one. I forget the name of it. It's one Mick did live. You forget that one. Remember? Oh, yeah. I forgot that one. <laughs> your Ben Jarofsky show for Tuesday, April 7th. <laughs> it's just moments away. But like a fool. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. I'm glad you're not feeling okay. But before we get into that, we got to thank the following unions for sponsoring this program. Unions like the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9 are sponsors, as well as the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. A giant thank you to those unions for sponsoring this show. Couldn't do it without you. And of course, today's Ben Jarofsky show is brought to you by our good friends, at the Chicago Federation of Labor. Ben, you want to uh, show meeting? You want to keep doing Song of the Day? Yes. Okay. Song of the Day. Wait, show meeting? <laughs> Boom, just like that. Man, that's how we roll. <laughs> that's our pre-show meeting while we're on the air. I tried to get him to read a commercial before the show. Oh, boy, that wouldn't happen. Oh, okay. two minutes before we went, oh, Ben, here's the copy. Well, have it, have it, have it, have it, have it, have it. By the way, just letting everybody know, you know, breaking, what is it, the fourth wall I'm breaking here? Yes. I bang my head on the seal. We're doing Holy the show live. Cow. Whoa, it's kind of trippy out here, folks. Hello. One pill makes you larger. But that's not the song of the day. I'm still giving love to Bill Withers. So I'm going to do, get me in a crowd of hot class people. Uh huh. And then you act real rude to me. You know that song? <laughs> it's, it's a, One more time. I need to hear it again just to make sure I haven't heard it. I, I, well, let me see what the part is that you would know. Um, you get me in a crowd of hot class people, and then you act real rude to me. That's my favorite line. And I think, you know, everybody likes Grandma's Hands and uh, Lovely Day, but I just love that. Get me in a crowd of high class people, and then you act real rude to me. Use me up. That's the name of the song. And then going to use me to use me up. Well, we appreciate you downloading our show. We really do. <laughs> the Ben Jarofsky Show starts now. It is Tuesday, April 7th, and live from Ben's house, this is the Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, it's the return of our good friend and president of the Chicago Principals Association, Troy LaRavier, over the phone. Now your host, he's been social distancing before it was cool. <laughs> yeah. Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Uh, hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here. We're calling this Mix Message Tuesday. Here's why. 
great week. You have a good weekend, D? No. <laughs> no, I know. It's kind of a, it's really hard to say. You know, the old gag had a great weekend because really these weekends, well, you know, we're all living through this together, folks. A lot of grimness, uh, a lot of social distancing, a lot of carnage every day. More horrendous news, horrific news, not just about the spreading uh, virus, the people who are dying, uh, the overwhelmed emergency workers, the, the people in the hospitals who don't have enough gowns, uh, the, the crowded buses. This is something that's just hitting home. Like people who have to go to work and they don't have a car, they're essential workers, they're on crowded buses, so they're just probably passing it around. We haven't figured out, look, all the dimensions of how to deal with this pandemic. We haven't really figured it out. And we have the worst leader of the country. I think, I've said this before, and I think it's true, even MAGA hat wearers, when they're alone, and no one's around, they admit to themselves, Good God, this president is wretched. But then again, of course, when they get out in public, ugh, he's a great president. We love him. No collusion. <laughs> no collusion. I see nothing. I hear nothing. No collusion. That's so played out now. <laughs> We're way beyond collusion. Well, except that, like, you could argue that Trump's colluding with the virus in some weird way. Anyway. No collusion. Uh, no collusion. Donald John Trump. Uh, he's always professing his innocence and his greatness. That's just part of the madness that has enveloped this country. Anyway, I just want to say uh, all was not lost on this weekend. Part of my mixed message theme amid the grimness, I watched a comedy and I was laughing. I watched Next Friday. I don't know if there anybody. Hey, finally watched Next Friday, guys. <laughs> well, I actually saw it back in the day. Oh, really? You did? Yeah. yeah. And because it came, you know, I think I said this uh, when I was talking about um, a Boomerang. But I'm never sure that I've seen a movie from the 90s because it's so long ago or the 80s, you know what I'm saying? So I'll rent it, and I, when I'm watching it, there'll be a scene, and I'll signal. I remember that one scene, like in Boomerang, for instance, his obsession with the feet of his girlfriend. Do you remember that? I don't know if you remember that. Anyway, I'll, as soon as I saw it, I go, oh, I saw this movie in the, in the 80s or 90s. And uh, oh, I wait, Take a toke, everybody. Brown line. There we go. Riding that train, high on cocaine. Uh, so Not anyway, high on cocaine. Guys. Next Friday, I urge everybody, if you're looking for a laugh, just looking for just a little diversion from the madness, Ice Cubes, next Friday, ha la -ri -is. A shout out to the guy who plays Roach. He's no longer with us. Did you know? Two people have passed on from that movie. Actually, Whoa. the guy who played Roach committed suicide. And John, uh, Witherspoon. John Witherspoon, who's hilarious. Uh, he's also hilarious in Boomerang, by the way. Little known fact, Johnny Wis Witherspoon was hilarious and boomer. Anyway, so I saw a comedy, made me feel uh, real good. And it was important to have a little diversion uh, from the madness that uh, is all around us because, folks, I didn't, can't even say I woke up on Tuesday and I discovered it was there all weekend. I just was keeping track of all the mixed messages that were getting sent to us, uh, admitted to us by our leaders, the people who are supposedly running the country and, you know, governing us and leading us. You know, we're all supposed to be in this together. Remember that one? We're all supposed to be responsible. We're all supposed to acknowledge the science of this all. You know, we, we're supposed to practice what we preach. I, I'm not going to get into haircut gate, okay? We'll get into that later. Uh, but let's just start with Donald Trump. I think it was on Friday. He, held he could use a haircut, by the way. <laughs> I we'll get just into this shave later. that sucker, I, buddy. I just believe. Just let it go, man. Just let. I'm with you on that one. Just let it go. But we'll get into uh, haircut gate because I think Donald John Trump is getting his hair attended to by somebody. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. All right. Anyway, so my, uh, Donald Trump holds a hearing, a briefing. Excuse me. I think it was Friday, maybe Saturday. All the days are coming together. D. I can't uh, keep track of them anymore. Uh, and at this briefing, he makes this big concession. Masks are needed, must wear masks. And then immediately he says, well, I'm not gonna wear a mask. You gotta wear a mask, I'm not wearing a mask. You know, give J.B. Pritzker credit, comes to his press conferences, he's wearing a mask. He's showing, this is, you know, I'm part, I'm, I'm sharing this with you. And I think Donald Trump doesn't wanna wear a mask because he doesn't think he looks good with a mask or it's gonna mess up his hair or he thinks it's gonna look vulnerable or somehow or other it's not manly to wear a there mask. You go. There you go. Yeah, you think that's the that's one? That's the one. Yeah, that's the one. So I'm not <laughs> wearing a mask. Uh-uh, not wearing a Not did, me. Did John Wayne wear a mask? <laughs> he wore a bandana. There was movies where John Wayne wore a bandana. But yeah, that's it. Oh, it's not manly. I'm not going to do it. You know, there's still a part of Donald Trump that's not willing to concede that this is a serious problem. He's He enjoys 
the fact that he's in the spotlight. He enjoys the fact that so many people turn to the TV to watch his briefings. He enjoys that part of it. But I'm not at all convinced that he believes uh, that uh, this really is a serious crisis facing America. And then there's the mixed message of his handling of Obamacare insurance. This one kind of got lost in the weeds uh, over the weekend. Uh, apparently, uh, Donald John Trump uh, supports offering national insurance uh, for COVID-19 related expenses. So it's essentially it's Medicare for all, but only if it's you know a COVID-19 related uh, expense. So the feds will pay, let's say, for your testing, all right, uh, to see if you have the virus. They'll pay for your testing, but they're not going to extend enrollment. Donald Trump announced uh, for. Oh, Someone's calling me. I'll just put this phone away. <laughs> yeah, come Always on. embarrassing when that happens. Uh, but they're not going to extend. <laughs> they're not going to extend uh, the enrollment period uh, for Obamacare. So this is interesting. Let's follow the logic, everyone. Uh, everyone needs insurance uh, when they're sick, but apparently only if they have the virus. Is that correct? That's the Donald Trump view of the world. Uh, it's like the coronavirus, COVID nineteen, is the only illness that they realize or will uh, acknowledge is a real illness. So it's like, then if you get into an argument with them, if you talk to a MAGA hat person about this, they'll say, well, Ben, you know, getting the virus is not the person's fault. So we have to protect them. Oh, like getting cancer is somebody's fault. You know what I mean? That should have done those sit-ups. You wouldn't have gotten the cancer. Madness, folks. Look, either believe in Medicare for all or you don't believe in Medicare for all. But, you know, as we figured out, D, why Donald Trump won't wear the mask because he, th he doesn't think it's manly. You know, it'll make him look weak or something. In this case, obviously, they've done their focus group uh, analysis and they realize that the hardcore uh, Trump supporters have this illogical opposition to Obamacare because Obama was the one who shepherded through the passage, and so they just have to always be against it. At the same time, they want <laughs> they want insurance for COVID nineteen related illnesses. So there's just like mixed message there. Well, insurance for one illness, but not insurance for the other illness. And meanwhile, my beloved Dems, they're still afraid of it. D. You know, 30% of the Democratic Party voted for Bernie. I would say 8% to 10% voted for Elizabeth Warren. So 40% of the Democratic Party, the people who voted, definitely want a Medicare for all. But apparently the other 60%, they're not sure. They think it's going to alienate swing voters. So they push it aside. That's, that's leadership. Remember that no leadership at this time when we need leadership the most. Mixed message coming from even my beloved Democratic Party. What other mis mixed message? Oh, the Tea Party. I'm still getting Tea Party updates. I appreciate it. I get about the four or five an hour. It seems like they're really... By the way, just on a, a related note, in terms of updates I've been getting, <clears throat> I've been getting these updates from uh, Baby Trump, Donald John Trump Jr., and they're, they're changing their messaging. They used to have this defiant message of, we are invincible. We will destroy the Democrats. The Democrats are a joke. Ugh, they're like Terminator. Ugh, <laughs> ugh, ugh. Now they're sending Sounds out like Tim Allen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. uh -huh. Tim Allen. That that's an art. That's a debate that Dennis and I had back in the old days. Yeah. Before I got the heave ho. Remember that debate? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I I said that there's no such thing as a funny Republican. Uh, that there's no great comic who's Republican. And Dennis said, Oh yeah. What about Tim Allen? To which I said, proves my point. Anyway, <laughs> uh, there's got to be a funny Republican out there. Tim somewhere. Allen. Yeah. He gets paid to make people laugh. Oh, oh that. <laughs> and they laugh. <laughs> Maybe a MAGA hat wearer here or there. Anyway. Well, they're people. You know what? Roseanne. I can see Roseanne. She was funny back in the day. And I'm not even sure she's a Republican. I think she's more no. of a libertarian. She's just out there, man. <laughs> she is out there. Uh, and it, God, I haven't heard from Roseanne in a long time. I wonder what she's making of all this. Anyway, Tea Party. Back to the Tea Party. Oh, no, back to Donald John Trump. So he's sending out mixed messages now. It, it, the, for, re, previously, they, they were going to uh, annihilate the Democrats. The Democrats were a joke. They were making fun of Democrats. And now it's like, Polls are showing we're in danger. Very much a dangerous situation. Eh, eh. Sending out like this message of warning. And the, the warning is that their polls, their eternal polls, basically say that the Republicans are in danger of uh, losing the Senate. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> They're a party run by lunatics at a time when we need responsible 
leaders with good judgment. Instead, we have the lunatic fringe of the Tea Party running the country, and you're worried about, yeah, you better be worried about that. How about changing your habits and your behavior? Like getting masks and ventilators to the states. That would be something you could do to maybe offset the eroding polls. Uh Uh-uh. Instead, they're doubling down. Send us money. Send us money. By the way, just I want to tell you all, Dems, one of my favorite themes. Uh, one of the things that the, the Joe Biden lovers, the Biden bros, have chastising me for, D, they say that I'm too eager to engage the, the Republicans in partisanship. Now, you remember that criticism, D? They said you, you should hold off to August. Well, I hate to break it to you, Biden bros. The Republicans are out there right now. We'll get into this a little more with Wisconsin, speaking of mixed messages. Republicans are out there right now. Anyway, Tea Party. They're sending out, they sent out this article over the weekend, which uh, was taking a look at the people who died. This is one of the most cold-hearted articles I've ever seen the Tea Party send out, and they've sent out some miserable articles. This is an analysis of the people who died uh, in New York uh, due to the virus. And they were pointing out that, according to their study, most of the people were older. And so they were arguing, it's just old people. That's a, they're back to the just old people argument. So there's really no reason to close down the economy. We should rethink our whole strategy, maybe open up part of the economy, open up stores, not being so tough on social distancing. They're still pushing this line. They're still pushing this line. The, it's like the president had this press conference. I think it's time to wear a mask. Then he says, oh, well, I'm not going to wear a mask, but it's really scary. These are dangerous times. And the Tea Party is sending out these uh, articles to all the little MAGA hat wearers out there, giving them their, you know, their marching orders, saying, well, you know, it's really basically old people, so maybe we should consider opening up the economy and letting people who aren't vulnerable go back to work, which is an interesting concept. Like, if you're just going to uh, open up the economy, allow people to go back to work, uh, no longer promote social distancing, no longer say you have to stay at home, you know, except for if you're an essential business, then... Who is going to determine whether someone is vulnerable or not? I mean, okay, maybe your study shows them. Let's just assume for the moment that your study is accurate, that it is mostly older people who are dying. Uh, But it could be younger people who carry the virus to them. So allowing younger people to go out into the marketplace where they can pick up the, the virus and then spread it is not really doing a good job in terms of containing it. So maybe it's not a good idea. And what if the younger person feels vulnerable and you're ordering him to go back anyway? Who He gets a note from his doctor. Who's going to determine whether the young person can go back to where I get it? The Tea Party and Donald Trump will decide. You have to go back to work. I don't believe your doctor. Hey, they're, they're back to death panels. Remember they were always criticizing the Democrats with their death panels? Mixed messages. The Tea Party, you know, they're more concerned about protecting Donald Trump from the political fallout of an economic recession or a depression. They're more concerned with coming up with a, a justification, an explanation that somehow or other pins the blame on Democrats for overreacting than they are in containing the virus. And Democrats wonder why I say you got to fight. You got to fight the, Dem- the Republicans hard. They're not playing by the same rules as you people. Democrats, wake up. Anyway, that was the mixed message I got from the Tea Party. I get them every hour on the. Thank I- God for those tea mails you get. My God, that's brought us so much content on you know the Benderofsky show. I th- I'm thinking of making a requirement that every Democrat in America get these <laughs> what things. What are you doing? No. Uh, no, I think they should get them because so many Democrats are wandering around under the illusion, well, you could just hold off until August on the election. Like the Republicans aren't out there right now, you know, fighting like hell to defeat Joe Biden and mock Joe Biden. Three months down the road, there's going to be a study. Uh, ben Jarofsky show listeners have gone tea party. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me when I tell you, there's nothing that the Tea Party sends out that will convince anyone with a brain to join the Tea Party. <laughs> I trust me. I read the. I get five. I used to say I get five a day. The reality is, they're about five an hour. They're pouring them in. Plus, I get the ones from Mitch McConnell and New Gingrich. 
somehow or other, I managed to find my way uh, to their mailing list. What else is there? Oh, my goodness, Wisconsin. I could talk about Wisconsin forever. Remember last, last week uh, we did a whole show, we did a show, a segment on Wisconsin. Today, uh, Tuesday, is the uh, election. Follow me in this, folks. This gets into all the themes. We're talking about the mixed messages, the, the way the Republicans play to win, the way Democrats play to, I don't know, run around and lose weight. I don't know why, why, what Democrats do when it comes to an election. Uh, you know, they're quite sure. Oh, ben, let's just get along with the Republicans, okay? Like, that's that's like the... Look how much weight I've lost. <laughs> <laughs> Running around. All right, so here we are. We're in the middle of uh, the pandemic, and today's the day of the uh, Wisconsin election. It's a primary, but there's also at stake a special election for Supreme Court, where a gentleman named Daniel Kelly, who's a little to the right of Brett Kavanaugh. Two uh, first names. Don't trust him. Oh, yeah, actually, I don't trust him. You know, Daniel Kelly and is running against uh, Jill Karofsky, and uh, we talked about her. She's a, sort of a liberal from a liberal judge and, or a liberal lawyer. And so it's a battle between Democrats and Republicans. A very important seat is at stake here, folks. Why? Because right now the state of Wisconsin is sort of split. The Republicans control the legislature. The Democrats control the governorship. Uh, they defeated Scott Walker, and they have a Democratic governor, Tony Evers. And so uh, he is trying to undo the damage that the Republicans have caused over the last 10 years. We talk about this a lot with union man Ed Maher, but one of the, th the most important things that uh, Scott Walker, the former governor of Wisconsin, did to uh, strengthen the Republican Party was to go after uh, union rights. He decimated the public unions in Wisconsin. Why? Because it gave Republicans a huge advantage. The public unions, by and large, supported uh, Democrats. Oh, they came up with some cockamamie excuse like liberty for workers or, you know, to, to reduce taxes uh, on people that would art otherwise go uh, to pay for salaries and then to turn around and use the savings, whatever savings there was, to give a hand out to Foxconn. So really... The, the poor cheeseheads in Wisconsin weren't any better off from a tax standpoint. And instead, they got Republicans controlling absolutely everything in the state because the unions were decimated and the Democrats lost some of their most important allies. It's all political. It's all political, but Democrats are like, well, we must figure a way to win over swing voters. How many times have I heard Democrats talk about those swing voters in Wisconsin? We must figure a way to win over swing voters in Wisconsin. Ben, could you not be so par be so partisan? Could you just like concentrate on the things we have in common with the Republicans? So we me all love cheese. <laughs> we all love cheese. And we all love football. I love the Packers. I love the Bears. So I'm always looking for things that we have in common with Republicans while Republicans are playing it to win. They get the brass knuckles out. So uh, this Judge Kelly, you know, who will rule in favor of the gerrymandered maps that the Republicans come up with to uh, to maximize their strength so they keep control of the state of Wisconsin because unlike uh, Democrats in Illinois, they don't believe in fair maps. They believe in maps that give them the advantage. Apparently, Democrats in Illinois want to play by the rules that uh, would give an advantage to the Republicans or at least nullify the advantage they have, but Republicans in Wisconsin play to win. So here they are in Wisconsin. You're having this uh, very important election, and it looks like Karofsky may win. She may beat uh, Daniel Kelly. So what do the Republicans do? Her name kind of sounds like... Her last name sounds like yours. That is very good observation. <laughs> I thought that the whole time we were discussing it last time. Jarofsky, Jarofsky. Say it 10 times. Oh, Jarofsky, wow. Jarofsky. We got to get her on the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that could be a new morning I, show. I know, yeah. Karofsky, yeah, Jarofsky, Jarofsky in the morning. In the morning. Uh, let's say. And she, by the way, she could sing Song of the Day just as well as I can. Oh, I bet she's better than you. you get me in a crowd of high class people. Uh huh. And then you act real rude to me. Anyway, <laughs> great Bill Withers. May he rest in peace. By the way, have you no discovered that everybody's suddenly a Bill Withers? Withers fan. Well, that's how that? it works. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he dies. Everybody's a Bill Withers fan. Uh, anyway, all right, back to Wisconsin. So the election was supposed to be today. Tony Evers says, well, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Let's delay the election. And we had an inter we had a similar uh, debate here in Illinois. Remember, D, about a month ago. What, about yeah. two weeks ago? I don't think it's resolved yet. March 17th. Wasn't that good? God. Yeah, St. Patrick's Day. For 10 trivia points. Oh, I can't even come up with that. That was the last day we did a show from the studio. Remember? Yes, it was. Get out the bond, baby. It was a long time ago. We were so scared. <laughs> Afraid to touch the doors, the railings. There was nobody in the uh, sometimes. Just That elevator scares the crap out of me in this uh, during this time. Elevators just... Well, 
Yeah. During I, a pandemic, elevators, no thanks. I'm with you even without the pandemic. I always took the stairs. I'm not going in that elevator. <laughs> uh-uh, negatory. You're not getting me in that elevator. Every now and then, I would have to go get the guest. And I have to go down uh, that You'd elevator. be the worst person to be stuck in an elevator. With I, no, I'd about run, 20 minutes, like, get me out of I'd, here. I'd run down the stairs. Like, oh, the old days at the, our beloved studio. I'd run down the stairs, meet the person on the side. But let's take the stairs. Uh, bet I have a bum leg. i got to take the elevator. Oh, God. I'm breaking into a sweat in the elevator. Anyway, back to Wisconsin. So Daniel Kelly, the Republican, uh, like a Brett Kavanaugh robot that's – uh, Jill Karofsky, the Democrat, like a Ruth Bader Ginsburg clone. So there you go, folks. And Karofsky looks like she could win. If there's a good turnout, she will win. What do the Republicans do? They're not dumb. Never said they were dumb. Maybe unethical. Maybe unprincipled. Maybe ha- uh, have no morals. I bet you've said dumb a few times. No, just a mega hat, guys. <laughs> <laughs> just a few of them, you know. Uh, so what do they do? They're going to do absolutely everything they can to make sure that the election is today. Why? Because everybody's too scared to vote. Be a a lower turnout. Lower turnout means the advantage to the Republicans, Daniel Kelly, because Republicans get their people out to vote. Democrats are too busy playing nice. They don't get their people out to vote. So they ever said, let's uh, extend the election uh, so that we don't have people going to the polls in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, let's extend the mail in to the time when we can send ballots in so we, we can close the polls on election day. Republicans, the legislators, uh, he issued an executive order doing that. The Republican legislators went to court. And guess what? They got the Republican members of the Supreme Court to rule on their best behalf. Oh, there's a big surprise. And it went up to the United States Supreme Court. And guess what? Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, man, they all fell in line. They all, fell, Clarence Thomas, and they got to uh, rule in the Republicans' favor there. So the election is today, probably be a, a very small turnout, and uh, which maximizes the chance for... <laughs> Sorry, shout out to Kyle on the live stream chat. He says, uh, well, the most important question is really, is uh, was Ben able to get that Chicago City Club certificate out of the studio? <laughs> <laughs> Kyle? Got bad news in that front. It's still there. It's probably covered with the virus. That's correct. I'm gonna have to scrub it down. And I love it too. I uh, for ten trivia points, D. Oh Jesus. Who, who did I get to autograph it? Uh, Dan Mialopoulos. Very good for knowing that young Daniel Mialopoulos, the ace investigative reporter for uh, for ten WB. trivia points. Are we saying his last name correctly? No, you are. I'm sure you are. I don't think we are. Uh, young Daniel, as I like to call him. Uh, he um, was the one who broke the story on, uh, oh, God, the good old days, D, when we could just go on and on about uh, <sighs> the City Club days. Gate. That water you know? fountain. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Let me just tell you something. The water in my house is almost as good as the almost. water at the bright one. Hold on. Almost as good. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Love that water. Sometimes water was delicious. Anyway, yeah, no, I uh, the City Club certificate is still there. <laughs> it's I uh, I didn't take it. I I didn't. I guess I wasn't thinking. We left on that Tuesday, and we were expecting to come back. And then the next day, we just said, "Nah, let's go let's go up to the attic." Anyway, so that's what's going on in the state of Wisconsin. Biden, the Biden Bros here in Illinois are going Ben. Let's wait until August. Then we'll start campaigning because we're all kumbaya at the moment. And we're really worried that swing voters in Wisconsin are going to think we're taking advantage of the pandemic for political purposes. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Republicans up in Wisconsin, they're not worried about the swing voters. They're in it to win. Come on, Democrats, wake up. We got a great show today, everybody. Troy LaRavier will be here. Well, they won't literally be here. He'll be on the phone. And I uh, can't wait to talk politics with Troy. Uh, Troy has been a regular on our show going back to the uh, first, no, not the, fr- the first week, I want to say. Uh, so plenty of political talk ahead of us. But before we do that, the man from Alton, the man they call the doctor with the news. Hey, guys, how's it going? Troy LaRavier, a uh, reoccurring guest. What are you going to talk with Troy about today? Let's keep these listeners listening, huh? I just had another drink of water. We can um, hear Oh my God, we're going to be talking about what else? The pandemic. And we're, probably the, the 
most alarming, or I, I can't, I can't even say most alarming. The headline in today's paper says it all. The Tribune, uh, Chicago's disparity statistics show disadvantaged communities hit harder. Blacks have died at nearly six times the rate as whites. Love to get Troy's uh, thoughts on that. Troy LaRavier, of course, is the uh, head of the Chicago Principals Association. But uh, before that, he was a big time Bernie supporter. I was a Bernie delegate, and he's a loud, proud voice for progressive politics in the city of Chicago. Get his thoughts on that. Uh, what are, you know, like what 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 might we have done? What might we have done? That's hard to say uh, before the pandemic hit to sort of like minimize the risks uh, in in poor neighborhoods uh, to uh, a pandemic. That you know, nobody ever thinks about this stuff while times are good. Remember, they wouldn't even they couldn't find the money to hire. Uh, nurses in the pub. Remember that? Remember that, D? The teachers had to go on strike to hire nurses? Now everybody's like, loving nurses. We want more nurses. We need more uh, medical workers. Yeah, we need lot, more supplies. A lot has changed since we've uh, last talked with Troy LaRavier, so everybody make sure you stick around for that. And uh, Troy and I did a little uh, pre-phone call to make sure everything was good. His phone line sounds decent. All right. That's good. <laughs> That's good. That's something else. I've got, I kind of got over that, D. You know? You, you know what I'm saying? I'm like... I'm glad you did. I was I really tripping in the early yeah, days. Yeah. I when was we beating myself attic. up over it, too. Oh, my God. Dennis was so hard on himself. All right. Uh, for all of our non-essential workers uh, who may be listening to the program, uh, maybe you've been cooped up inside your apartment or house for the last three or four weeks. Uh, maybe I'm helping you out here and saying this. Yes, it's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I know every day is starting to feel like Saturday by now. Oh, and another thing, I know it's easy to not wear pants and just hang out in your underwear all day because you have nowhere to go and nothing to do. But for the love of God, listeners, if you want to come out of your quarantine feeling like a good person, please keep putting on pants. <laughs> it's literally the least that you can do to feel productive. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's you know? a public service announcement. This message brought to you by pants. <laughs> All right, let's talk about what's happening in Chicago and or Illinois this afternoon. First up, our billionaire Illinois governor. Yes, that's billion with a B. Well, it's a day ending in Y, so our Illinois governor, J.B. Pritzker, will be delivering his daily COVID-19 press conference at the Thompson Center at around 2.30. Not sure when you're listening to this, but if you want to stay informed and if you've yet to do so, we highly advise that you watch J.B. Pritzker's daily COVID-19 press briefing. Moving on, and my how times have changed. Yes, Lori Lightfoot got a haircut. <laughs> how dare she? I'm not a perfect person. More on that in moments. But first, people, my little hometown of Alton, Illinois, has made the national yes, news. It did. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's for something I would never imagine in a million years they made the national news for until now. The following comes from HuffingtonPost.com. And hey, our Chicago mayor isn't the only one with problems at the moment. The mayor of a small city in Illinois, Alton where producer Dennis was born, warned citizens that he had ordered police to break up parties and issue citations to enforce the state's stay-at-home orders. Yes, even people downstate are trying to abide by these stay-at-home orders. These orders are meant to slow the coronavirus pandemic. But when the officers broke this party up, they found the mayor's wife! <laughs> At one of these gatherings. Mrs. Mayor. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> There's trouble in paradise in that household. Holy cow. The mayor, his name is Brant Walker. Never met him in my life. He says, quote, these are very serious times, and I'm begging you to please stay at home. Parents, please keep your kids at home. Doing so is vital to your health. On Monday, Brant Walker issued a statement on Facebook saying police had found his wife at a bar in the city that was operating in violation of Governor J.B. Pritzker's stay-at-home orders. Walker said he was embarrassed and apologized to his constituents. Here's a quote from Walker here. It says, My wife is an adult capable of making her own decisions, and in this instance, she exhibited a stunning lack of judgment. Uh, she will face the same consequences for her ill-advised decision as the other individuals. Uh, caught, in, caught at the event, he added. Walker did not provide the name of his wife, nor uh, was she identified in local news reports. Police told the Alton... Who would have thought? I'm sitting here reading a story from Alton, Illinois, in our Ben Jarofsky show in Chicago. In the attic. In the attic. 
Good Lord, get the bong out. <laughs> Police told the Alton Daily News that officers broke up a party at Hiram's Tavern early Sunday. Never been to Hiram's. I know of Pete's Lounge. I know of Norb's. I know of uh, Max Timeout. Not Hiram's. Never <laughs> been to Hiram's. Uh, the owner was arrested on an outstanding warrant for domestic battery while others in attendance received citations for reckless conduct. Alton Bendrovsky for 10 trivia points. What's the population of Alton, Illinois? 3,847. 26,000. Oh. Alton is a city of some 26,000 people located about 20 miles north of St. Louis, Missouri. Ben Jarofsky, your thoughts? I mean, besides uh, why this mayor didn't know his wife was at a party to begin with. There's um, so much here. But first of all, I'd like to say one thing. I'm really surprised you'd never heard of the bar. That, no, that I've never been thing. to Hiram's. I mean, it's... That, that but that shows you how I don't understand Alton. Remember, I thought Alton was three thousand four. I thought it was a small town. You would absolutely mm -hmm. know the bar, and you never heard of it. Oh, well, there's a lot of bars, and maybe uh, it's a bar that's open since I've lived there. I've uh, almost been out of Alton for uh, ten years now. So. Mm, all right. So, what are my thoughts? I thought that uh, the mayor gave a very heartfelt apology. Uh, I appreciate appreciated how he handled this. Pretty embarrassing, you know. And so this, we're going to get into this more with with Lori Lightfoot, but. You know, we're trying to promote this notion that we're all in this together. We're trying to promote this notion that everybody has a part, a role uh, in trying to prevent the spread of the uh, virus. Here is the, the Sun-Times now. I don't know if you saw this, D. Above the headline, uh, excuse me, above the masthead in the front page of the newspaper uh, has put the following message. Be a social distancing star. Stay home. Stay safe. Stay six feet apart when you must go outside. Oh, God, I could go on and on about my obsession about keeping that six feet outside distance when I go for a walk. And I'll spare you that for the moment because I, I feel it. It may be, it may come on a little later in the show. But uh, so, you know. I was going to say, we've got three more days here, pal. Hold it. <laughs> well, probably more than that. I got a feeling we'll be in this attic for a while. Uh, but um, it's very embarrassing, obviously, uh, when the mayor's wife uh, is caught in a bar uh, violating the governor's order that bars be closed. And I thought he handled it pretty well. You know, he, he first of all, he was very apologetic. He, he was very honest, he called it a stunning lack of judgment. He didn't try to sugarcoat it. He didn't try to dismiss it. He didn't try to come up with some excuse. So I give him credit for that. And uh, now the part that interests me in your introduction, uh, D, you said even people downstate are abiding by the rule. <laughs> And I know that uh, when the, the epidemic was first hitting Illinois, when we were first becoming aware of it, again, ancient history, I think this would have been at the end of February, the very beginning of March, mm -hmm. and we were still taking the train, and you were showing me um, Facebook bits that your friends from downstate were posting in which they were completely dismissive of J.B. Pritzker's leadership on this up front. Were, they were sort of mocking the notion that it was a, a, a serious health hazard and uh, they were basically basking in their, uh, like this libertarian attitude that so many people have adopted. Uh, they pick and choose what issues they're gonna be libertarians on, but that's a whole other subject. Uh, so are you telling me that things have changed downstate as far as you know, that people are taking it a little more seriously and they're uh, paying, giving a little more yeah. respect to it? Yeah, 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 they're being a little more concerned. And are they being more respectful yeah, uh, toward yeah. J.B. Pritzker? Are they still I mocking? I don't know about that. <laughs> still mocking J.B.? Hey, listen, he's a douchebag, but you know, he may be right about this one. <laughs> what are they got against J.B.? I just, you know, could you explain that to me? Help me out. Let, let's take a, a, a trip into the mind of a downstate voter. What do they got against J.P. Pritzker? I guess the taxing, you know, taxzilla. <laughs> He's going to tax us. But they don't have taxes downstate? What, Alton? Somehow or other, the roads get magically paved without tax dollars? The police get magically paid without tax dollars? Could you imagine me doing a talk show in Alton? Yeah, oh you'd God, be fired right. day one. Actually, I disagree. First of all, I think that I'm more in tune with people of downstate Illinois and the issue of marijuana. That is definitely sure than the Republicans are, who are member rounder going down state. So I think actually I have some accord, at least on the reefer issue. But yeah, probably uh, uh, the fact I'm, I'm too liberal for them and other things. So anyway, I that I believe is the, probably the best way you can handle such an embarrassment. Uh, just own up to it and uh, say that... Uh, 
you know, his wife showed a stunning lack of judgment and move on. We'll see how she, uh, if, if she gets punished any less than all the other people. That'll be an interesting fallout. Right. By the way, and why are they not naming her name? Well, it'd be nice, I guess, you know. What? I don't think he wants to, like, divorce this woman, you know. No, but the papers, the police, you know, we're not naming the name. I mean, what, what, why? Well, the mayor's got some pull, you know what I mean? Hey, leave her name out of that. Yeah, I just realized, you know, I was just praising him. Like, why is her name left? They didn't, they didn't like, we're concealing the name of the bar because we don't want to uh, disrespect it. We want to show, you know, a little respect to them. They named the bar. Why? You know? Well, the mayor, the alt mayor's got a little pull, you know what I mean? All right, I'm letting that one go. But I suddenly, you know, that 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 mind, that contrarian mind of mine. Oh, I started off saying something nice about the mayor, and then automatically, they they wouldn't put up with me in two minutes in Alton D. All right, grab your Mountain Dew. We're leaving Alton, and we're going to Chicago. From a mayor of about twenty-six thousand people to uh, one uh, from millions. The following comes from WG in Chicago. Yes, haircut gate <laughs> is here. <laughs> The following comes from WG in Chicago. Photo surfaced over the weekend showing Mayor Lori Lightfoot after she got a haircut amid the state's stay-at-home orders. A woman posted photos on Facebook Sunday. Oh, Lori can't stand this lady. Oh, no. Why'd you post that? A woman posted photos on Facebook Sunday saying she, quote, had the pleasure of giving Mayor Lori Lightfoot a hair trim. In the photos, the mayor is standing next to the woman, and they are not standing six feet apart. Plus, neither one was wearing a mask. Uh, let's see here. The post said, quote, thank you for all the hard work and dedication put forth to help our city. Beauty and hair salons are among the many businesses closed to the public amid the statewide orders. The mayor was asked about the trim during a press conference Monday. Uh, we have the quote from Lightfoot. Lightfoot said, quote, I'm in the public every day, and candidly, my hair was not looking the way it did, she said. I thought I would do it myself, but I thought it would be a disaster, so I got a haircut. Ben, you ever tried cutting your own hair? Never. I don't have to. I'm married to a hairdresser. Oh, lucky you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is not an issue I have to deal with. Uh, so anyway, continue. When asked if she was sending mixed messages to Chicagoans, Lori Lightfoot said that she practices what she preaches but said because she is a public figure, she got the haircut. Uh, Lori Lightfoot said, quote, I'm the public face of this city. I'm on national media, and I'm out in the public eye. I'm a person who takes their personal hygiene very seriously. Lightfoot said the person who cut her hair wore gloves and a mask. She also said those photos are some of the few she has taken with anyone since the pandemic hit. The mayor has been admitting about uh, getting Chicagoans to stay inside, or she's been admin about getting Chicagoans to stay inside and uh, takes precautions seriously since the pandemic started. Wow. So much there. So much there. Where do I start? Haircut gate. Um, you know, the... Um, what I, times we live in, haircut I, gate. You know, it's one of these classic flag blowing in the breeze moments. Where I see it one way, one, one moment, and the next, another way, the next moment. You know, one of the, I'm, I'm known for those, right? What are what's some of the other classic issues where I was like, ah, you know, on one hand this, and the other hand that? This is one of those. Uh, Maya, I was talking to Maya, getting prepared for an interview we're going to do. We're going to drop that interview uh, later tonight. Our Chicago Reader colleague, Maya Dukmasov. Yeah, that Maya. Hmm. And I mentioned Haircut Gate to her, and boy, did she go on. Oh, my. People are dying. And she pointed out correctly this is a very serious pandemic this is a triviality this is not a substantial issue Get, stop it people don't even talk about it now, that was her attitude and a lot of people have that attitude i've seen that attitude um all throughout the social media on the other hand talking about mixed messages they don't get much more mixed than this the notion is that we're supposed to be sacrificing things in this uh, pandemic. And one of the things that a lot of people are sacrificing uh, is their haircuts. I know this on a very personal level uh, because, as I said, my wife is a hairdresser. And her the shop she works at is closed. Business is closed. We're losing that income. And uh, a lot of people are not looking good. They're sacrificing. It's a little sacrifice. Rude. Not a Rude. It's not a big sacrifice. If I think of all the sacrifices that we're making at this time of this pandemic, looking bad or not looking at your best is kind of the least of it. It's not even in the top 20. So, 
you know, the notion that somehow or other you're the way you look or the way you think you look, I mean, it kind of heads into Trump country. Trump won't wear the mask. We just talked about Trump won't wear the mask. We won't wear the mask. Why? We theorize because he thinks it looks unmanly. And uh, so Lori Lightfoot wants to have a certain look when she goes out. It's very important to her to have that look when she goes out there. And she's really irritated that anybody would question her on that subject. That irritates me right there and then. I have this issue with all powerful mayors. Goes back to Daly. Just didn't start with Lori. Went through with Rom. They feel rules don't apply to them. To quote Dennis's Uncle Eldon, Rules for thee, not for me. You're welcome, Uncle Eldon. Was it actually Uncle Eldon who said that? I it think was, so, yeah. Was it Uncle Eldon? Rules for thee, not... I always Sorry get... for all the downstate trash in there earlier, but there you go. We came around. <laughs> By the way, I always have issues with that one. My, the dyslexia kicks in, and half the time I say rules for me and not for thee, and Dennis is like, oh, Ben, it's rules for thee, not for me. So you always notice there's a pause before I deliver the line that's the dyslexic pause folks you know uh joe biden talked about stuttering how he's been battling stuttering his whole life and you could tell before he starts a sentence he's fighting it i i can appreciate that because if you got dyslexia it's no joke so pause rules for thee not for me so is it an important significant issue uh when you consider the fact that people are dying that we have an incarcerated population, as Maya pointed out, that's exposed to the virus. We don't know what to do about it. That, uh, as the uh, headline in the Chicago Sun-Times points out, a deadly divide, 70% of Chicago's virus victims are African-American. That we're, the, we're dealing with long-term impact of poverty, of our inability or reluctance or disinterest uh, in trying to help the most vulnerable people among us. I will re re remind you folks, it was only in November that the city forced the teachers to go on strike because they did not want to commit the money to hire nurses, all right? So we in the city of Chicago are so quick to criticize the Republicans and Donald John Trump, and I admit they are insane and they are lunatics and they are not looking out for the... Uh, long-term interests of the people in this country. But we should also be accountable for the things we do here in the city of Chicago. And one of the things we've done in the city of Chicago is ignore the needs of people in our most vulnerable, high crime, impoverished neighborhood. We close mental health clinics in high crime areas at a time when people were, murder rates were going up. And we did it to save a few nickels and dimes, remember that? That was not Republicans who did that. That was Democrats who did that. That was Mayor Rahm Emanuel and the Chicago City Council. And they were following up, as Dr. Ehrman has pointed out more than not once, on policies, public health cuts by Richard M. Daley and this current administration. So, come forward. The issue is, should we criticize Lori Lightfoot for getting a haircut in the middle of a pandemic? considering that she just put out that public service announcement. Remember that one, D? They were good, too. They were good. They were funny, and they were accentuating a point, one of which was you shouldn't w worry about what your hair looks like at a time of a pandemic because it's really important to stay at home. And so it turns out that she is worried about how her hair looks, and she's bringing in the uh, hair cutter to take care of her. All right? Rules for thee. Not for me. Should we, as Democrats in the city of Chicago, look the other way? A lot of people say we should. You ever notice, D, when it comes to criticizing Donald Trump, no issue is too trivial for Democrats to rip Donald Trump? Okay, I'm joining. The, I'll rip him anytime, any place. But you don't hear Democrats in the city of Chicago saying, well, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Let's not criticize Donald Trump for, let's say, what? let's think one violation of many. Oh, remember when he would like have the press conferences and everybody would be crowded, crowded around or the briefings, everybody would be crowded around and he would still shake hands Yeah. and he would still like adjust the microphone. Here, let me shake your hands. Let me lick my hand. Now I'm going to adjust the microphone. And he was signing the bill and he's like giving everybody a pin. Like, There's your own pin. There's your own pin. I've, Fauci's like, good God. People in the city of Chicago are losing their collective minds. I was one of them. But we're told, don't criticize Lori Lightfoot. 
That, it goes beyond Lori Lightfoot. I've dealt with the mentality of Chicagoans. They don't like it, many of them, when their beloved mayors are criticized. I dealt with this in the daily years all the time. I criticized daily. Man, I would. you should see the letters they wrote to the reader. You can still read them. They're online. You blithering idiot. Go back to Detroit. You know, they always said go back. ChicagoReader.com. <laughs> I don't even from Detroit. Chicagoans have this like infatuation with their mayor this like the mayor is all important so now they're saying you can't criticize the mayor because we're in a pandemic and people are dying and i understand that and yes it is relatively trivial that the mayor got a haircut in the midst of the pandemic it does not rank among the top 20 issues that we're confronting but it does send a simple message you know we're talking about Sac mutual sacrifice in this critical time. And it's not a good message to send. And I think Lori Lightfoot could have handled it better. You know, she could have been a little more like, dare I say, the mayor of your hometown, D, who owned up to it. Brant apologized. Walker! You know, maybe she could have said, B dub. You know, probably wasn't the brightest thing I could do to get this. And then, you know, well, she was wearing gloves and a mask. But when they did the picture together that was on so social network, on a Facebook or wherever it was, you know, the hairdresser isn't wearing a mask, isn't wearing gloves. They're standing right next to each other. Wrong messages, bad messages to send out. And by the way, you're you're right about one thing. Wow. Ooh, Lori Lightfoot's mad at that hairdresser. <laughs> it was the hairdresser put, get, like promoting it. I love, and it was like, I love Lori Lightfoot. She's wonderful. She's perfect. So anyway, Chicagoans, I just point this out. I know about half of Chicago's mad at me. Ben, you're wasting time talking about it. There are more important things to talk about. I'm just saying, Chicago, your love for your powerful mayors. It de I see it go from one mayor, and I'm guilty of it. I love Harold Washington. That got the little... Uh, and I love Brant Walker. <laughs> but I, even I was critical of Harold on the, the White Sox deal. Even I, as much as I love Harold. You know, I go, God, talking about a deal from 1985, I wonder... Go back and read the articles, folks. Yeah, I was hard on hair in Washington for the white side. So anyway, Chicagoans, your love for your mayor is, you know, it's just like one of those little fetching things that Chicago have. They just love their mayors, like to just trot in line behind their mayors, criticize anybody who dares to criticize their mayor. And I hate to say it, D, uh, the people in Alton, the mayor in Alton handled his controversy a little better than our mayor did. And, you know, I just got to say it, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, bad message or not, Haircut looks pretty good. <laughs> All right, moving well, that's, on. That, that's the important part. <laughs> pretty good haircut. Ha haircut. You know, good haircut. I mean, it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, before we wrap it up here, we got one more story. The following comes from the Chicago Sun-Times. And yeah, she's still got it, guys. Fran the Woe Man Spielman. All right, says here, Chicago and Illinois are a, quote, long away from lifting the stay-at-home order because the number of coronavirus cases in Chicago and Illinois is, quote, not near the peak, Mayor Lori Lightfoot said today. Governor J.B. Pritzker's stay-at-home order was due to expire Tuesday before being extended until April 30th. Lightfoot had already extended the closing of Chicago public schools through April 20th before that extension. On Tuesday, a.k.a. today, the mayor was asked to articulate the criteria that would be used by the city and state to determine when shuttered non-essential businesses would be authorized to reopen and when residents would be free to leave their homes, return to work, and once again enjoy the everyday freedoms uh, they once took for granted. Lightfoot said, quote, we're a long way away from that, and we are actually exploring that question now. We've been talking all along about a peak in the number of cases, and then thinking about what the downward uh, slide of that will be. We are looking at when we think now we will reach that point. We went from seeing cases double every one to two days. Now we're in in the 9 to 10 range, which is obviously progress, but we're not near the peak, so I don't want to raise false expectations that uh, it's coming sometime soon. We don't know that based upon the modeling that we've seen, but we've closely, uh, what we're closely looking at that and looking at what we, what would be in the way in which we would come out of a stay at home order. Yeah, stay at home order is not going anywhere. We all know that. Who are we kidding? You know, I have this feeling. That if we survive this, I'm going to be optimistic and say we will uh, survive. Uh, civilization will survive this pandemic. That uh, journalists down the road 
historians down the road will take the deep dive and take a look at how all our leaders responded, and it will not be a good story, folks. Uh, as I think about all the mixed messages, all the stops and starts on what we have to do uh, since we first heard about this virus in China, you know, remember D? And everybody across the board minimized it. Across the board. Yeah. Now, we minimized it on the local level. I remember the first press conference that Lori Lightfoot had or talking about, I don't know, literally it was her first press conference, but talking about how it was important that we uh, not exaggerate and we should still go out uh, to restaurants, particularly concerned about Chinatown. And I completely agree with her. I don't know why people were being biased against Chinatown as opposed to any other uh, restaurant in the city. But again, she was viewing it from as a economic development uh, matter, as something that would affect businesses. They weren't taking it seriously as a health matter. And Donald Trump and the Republicans, they're like 10 times, 100 times worse uh, than any Democrat on this matter. Just look at the insanity of Florida right now. And Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, the, keeping the beaches open, keeping the bars open when the uh, college kids are down there. you know. And then, okay, now that the college kids are gone, they got their money, they sold their booze, now they're talking about maybe closing them. So uh, the, it's, it was, it's been terrible from, uh, from the get-go. Not, I guess people were just disbelieved. They just didn't believe it. You know, it's like, we're so powerful. We're doing so great. The, the stock market's doing great. Our city is thriving. Uh, I'm, I'm doing well in the polls. I don't want to just con deal with this negativity. And they just put their head in the sand. Everybody did to a certain degree. Uh, so here we are now. And uh, who's stepping up and being a leader? Uh, I give Lori Lightfoot a lot higher grades than I would give, let's say, uh, Donald John Trump. Uh, but as, who was it that said this? Uh, the bar is awfully low. Who was it that was saying that? Oh, Romana. Remember in Romana's interview? I was like, you know, Cuomo's not bad. Well, Ben, that's, <laughs> the bar is really low. Romana Hussein was saying that when we had the interview. So I think she's right. I think it's going to be a while before uh, we're back at that studio, Dean. By the way, speaking of Romana, she was a guest on our Benny J bonus interviews this weekend. And uh, you guys should check those out if you've yet to. Miles Camp Lassen, Maya Duke Masava. Oh, no, Maya wasn't a bonus. It was Miles. It was, uh, help me out here, Let's ben. see if you could do Come on, this is short term memory. Let's see if the reefer is caught up with you. No, I got it. Okay. It, it was Saturday. Uh, Saturday was Miles Camp Lassen. Sunday. Sunday was Romana Hussein. Monday. Monday was Mick Dumkey. Mick Dumkey. Uh, Very good. Yeah, and it was all things Bob Dylan. Yes. Oh, only only for McDumkey, not with Ramada and oh, uh, Miles. That's what I meant by McDumkey. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, it's a very interesting interview Ben had with McDumkey. Politics, not so much. Bob Dylan, oh, yeah, you better believe it. So go check that out. All of our uh, weekend bonus interviews, we plan to be doing the same thing this weekend as well. Benny J Bonus Interview is downloadable at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites and wherever else you download podcasts. And I always want to say I'm really excited about this uh, interview I got coming up tomorrow. I'm I'm taking advantage uh, with these bonus interviews just to uh, get what I consider really smart people uh, talking about topics that may be a little off the path that I usually talk about. So Mick Dumkey and I did the whole Bob Dylan thing. Joe Cowley the week before we did the Bulls. That was that. Uh, folks, can I just give a shout out to Joe Cowley? Joe Cowley is the beat writer for the Chicago Sun-Times, covers the Bulls. Dennis doesn't allow me to talk sports. Let me just get this in here right now. Joe Cowley had the scoop. He had the scoop on uh, Paxson and Foreman being out at, with the Bulls weeks ago. And uh, ESPN broke, uh, came up with the story on Friday, I want to say, and the Tribune had a uh, front page of the sports section. Uh, uh, Foreman and Paxson out. I'm like, Joe Colley had that three weeks ago when he talked about it in our show a week before then. Anyway, Joe Colley, you're the man. Uh, and so, yeah, so we did that. And coming up next week, Scotty D, Scotty Duff, Great uh, Chicago comic and I will be taking the deep dive on Tiger King. And I'm really looking forward to that one. I'm obsessed with Tiger King. So. Oh, yeah, and uh, also, you know, if I had to talk sports all the time, it wouldn't be as special, those Joe Colley interviews, by the way. Very good. Well done. And by the way, if anybody even remotely interested in basketball, check out that one. Joe Colley uh, does a great job just taking us through it. Uh, a to Z on the Chicago Bulls. And I noticed you uh, didn't mention this little fact here. Scott Duff, also host of a program called Out Chicago on WCPT 820. <laughs> 
The station you, that fired Ben. You mean w Sundays, 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. W. See you later, Ben. Yeah, that's that, the that's yeah. Station. They fired you. Yeah, I've been known to have a few uh, people from there. St- I'm not. <laughs> I don't hold it against the, everybody at the station. <laughs> Just Pinhead. That's the only one. <laughs> All right. Shout out to the live stream chat. Everybody on there, you're weighing in here and talking. And uh, we want to go ahead and ask you guys the question. Uh, should Wisconsin have their primary Ooh. election today? Gee, I didn't know you were going to be asking that question. Well, I'm doing that it right pre-show now. pre-show planning. <laughs> yeah, we do none of that. <laughs> we have a cup of coffee and talk yeah. about the Bulls. Yeah. No, we spent 10 minutes talking about next Friday. <laughs> okay, we want to still keep doing the show, so okay. let's not admit so much <laughs> okay. on the program. All right, <laughs> weigh in on the live stream chat, everybody. And hey, feel free to send us an email, too, if you're ever bored, if you have any uh, guest suggestions, ideas for the show, you want to make fun of Ben, tell us how much you don't like the show i don't know whatever you want to do just send us an email benny j show at gmail.com b-e-n-n-y the letter j show at gmail.com i read the emails and then i forward them to ben so we're always uh you know waiting for your emails as well all right i think we're going to take a break here when we come back the one the only troy laravier is going to be joining us over the phone don't go anywhere everybody it's the ben jarofsky show live from ben's house
Oh, hey, Ben. Stop clapping. Shout out to the curls. Go check out their music, everybody. Big fans of the curls. If you're in a band or you know someone who's in a local band and uh, they need some exposure, and what are you? Oh, I thought you were eating something there. Oh, drinking water. It's not like you are eating a nacho or something there for a minute. <laughs> nacho, uh, nacho man. <laughs> I want to be sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, if you're in a band or you know someone who's in a band and uh, they need some exposure, well, we'd love to play their music on the Ben Jarofsky show. If they don't sue us, <laughs> Benny J show. <laughs> that would G- be the key part. That yeah. is really the key part. Benny J show at gmail.com. B E N N Y. The letter J show. Dot com. If it's SoundCloud, send me a link. If you got an MP3, send me an MP3. Just me. Don't Ben won't take care of that. I'll be taking care of that. All right. And uh, we'll get the music uh, set up and you guys can help out and have music on our program. All right. Hour number two of our show featuring Troy LaRavie is just moments away. But before we do that, we got to thank the following unions once again for sponsoring this program. Unions like the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local 126 and District 8. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 9. The International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 150. And of course, today's Ben Jarofsky Show is brought to you by our good friends at the Chicago Federation of Labor. That's correct. All right, Ben, let's call up Troy LaRavier and see if we can get him here and we'll have him on the program. What do you say, buddy? My favorite part of the show where you call somebody on Facebook. (laughs) That's what we're doing here. Everybody loves Zoom, but we use Facebook. That's how we, if we roll. If everybody goes one way, we go the other way. All right, we're calling up <laughs> Troy now, and we want to remind everybody, please check out our Benny J bonus interviews. Okay, I think we have Troy. There we go. He's asking for the video. Wave hi to Troy. There he is. All What's right. going on, Troy? We got to figure out the audio. This happened the other day. Hang tight with us, Troy. We're going to figure this out. One second. All right, we should be good. Troy, you there? Huh? Troy I'm right here, brother. Oh, awesome. loud and clear. There you What's are. up, my brothers? From my brothers? <laughs> we're we are surviving. Troy, I'm uh, doing the show from the attic. It looks where are you where are you located right now? I am in my apartment uh, downtown. So you're uh, practicing social distancing. Let's just talk a little bit about it. How's it uh, impacted your life uh, over the last couple of weeks? Um. When it first started, I was visiting school. Um, I'd go to schools in the morning. I would drop by. I gave a couple of principals coffee, check in on them. And then I quickly had to shift what I was doing because CTS was doing so much that it wasn't supposed to do that I had to get in front of my computer. I had to contact people. I had to uh, do everything from do surveys of members to petition the governor to intercede uh, to stop CTS from uh, trying to compel people who were medically vulnerable uh, from reporting to schools. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I found myself uh, sort of creating a little war room right here in this spot, uh, either here or at the house uh, in Beverly, mm-hmm. uh, so that I can uh, advocate for the people who lead our schools. All right, uh, just to remind everybody, probably didn't do the greatest job of introducing Troy. You've been on the show so many times. I just assume uh, everybody knows who you are, but Troy LaRavie is president of the Chicago Principals Association. Uh, He is also a committed progressive, a real progressive. He was a Bernie Sanders delegate in 2016. He's been coming on our show ever since I've had a show. Uh, He lost his job as a principal in the Chicago public schools because he had the guts to defy uh, Mayor Rahm on issues of privatization, uh, on issues of gender editorial services. Uh, and so that's why he would be concerned uh, about what uh, Chicago Public Schools, CPS stands for Chicago Public Schools. We have a lot of out-of-town listeners, uh, Troy. Uh, so when Troy comes on, we talk local issues like what the mayor and the Board of Education uh, is requiring of principals and teachers and students at the public schools. And we also do the deep dive on national issues, Trump, Bernie, Biden, etc. So let's start local since you uh, introduced the local issue first, Troy, and then we'll get to the national stuff, all right? Um, we, sure. Chicago Public Schools uh, is doing what it, it's not supposed to do. What do you mean by that? You, uh, you, you what, what, what are they doing that they shouldn't be doing? So we surveyed our members, and one-fourth of them, 25%, have a uh, 
comorbidity condition, asthma, heart disease, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, and CPS, you know, in their food distribution program, were um, trying to compel them to come out and help with the distribution and put themselves at risk. Um, I mean, we want to serve like everybody else, but if you're in a high-risk group, then you should be at home. Those of us who are not in a high-risk group, uh, absolutely. You know, every time I go out to, to grocery shop and I see those tellers there, uh, those cashiers there risking their health and safety so that we can do something as simple as get groceries, uh, I certainly think that those of us who can should be out there helping with the effort to distribute food. But if you are someone with a comorbidity condition, a high-risk condition, again, 25% of CPS principals are, um, which begs the question, what are working conditions like in CPS that creates a condition where 25% of the principals um, are high-risk in terms of their health condition? Not only that, but 54% are either high-risk or live with someone who is. Uh, and so they did not have an exception for these people. And so one of the things that I fought to do was to create that exception. We eventually won that fight. They were also telling principals in contradiction to the governor's orders that they would have to use uh, benefit days if they, uh, if, even if they had a high-risk condition and wanted to uh, stay home. And the network chiefs were doing this. Not all of them. They're really supported, supportive network chiefs. And for your audience, network chiefs are the people who supervise groups of principals. They typically have anywhere from 20 to 40 principals underneath their supervision. And so some network chiefs were telling principals via telephone or phone conference, they wouldn't put it in writing, that they had to use their benefit days if they didn't, if they felt they were high risk and couldn't show up, which was a lie. Uh, and so I would give principals instructions. Every time a network chief tells you that, send that network chief an email validating or attempting to uh, uh, verify what you heard in writing. And every time they did that, they would get no response back in writing, of course, because they were telling them lies. Um, and eventually the network chief would have someone clarify and tell them the truth. So just things like that, trying to protect the health and safety of our members who are um, high-risk population, and also find ways to support those who are not high-risk who are out there serving in the school and who want to do more than just distribute food. You know, they're educational leaders, and they're not getting the kind of guidance that you would expect uh, in terms of educational leadership work. How do we organize our teachers to do distance learning appropriately? How do we organize it in an academic sense and also uh, take into account the social and emotional effect that this might be having on some of our students? That kind of leadership has been absent from a district level. And so we've been trying to do some things to uh, uh, make up for that. And so that's just a small sample of uh, what we've been up to. Well, you mentioned distance learning. It's a concept that uh, has emerged in the last couple of weeks, last few weeks, uh, since the schools are closed and children are at home. Uh, and they're they're uh, not in a classroom. I struggle with this, Troy. Uh, I'm not certain that. Oh, my brother. Yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I struggle with it on hey. many levels. Part of it, and and this is I'm speaking now as a guy who struggled in school and and was not the 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 best of students. Uh, like the notion that somehow or other we should be expecting students. Uh, to be learning as though they were in a classroom while they're in the midst of this crisis, it just um, seems far-fetched and unrealistic, uh, and I'm kind of resistant to that. And then I, I don't like to pr say that, Troy, because it's so politically incorrect. We should all be saying children should be learning every single day. They're like little sponges, and they have to absorb information at all times so they can compete keep pace with all the other little sponges out there. Uh, so I realize I kind of keep sort of keep my thoughts, my skepticism to myself. Um, what's your view on this? Um, 
So you said two things there. Um, in particular, you said sort of how could they be learning in this crisis, right? And that's why I talked about the social and emotional aspects as well as the academic aspects, number one. Number two, look, man, I have a 12-year-old son, you know, and I think oftentimes we progressives and we liberals, we just go a little far, man. <laughs> you know, it's a crisis. It's not a crisis for him, man. He's at home. He's at home trying to play as many video games as he possibly can. I don't want to hear it. You go learn. You are going to do something to continue to develop yourself as an academic, intellectual, social, social and emotional being. I'm not trying to hear it, man. Like, if you have concerns, you know, if there are some anxiety, there should be ways to talk about them, to surface them, uh, which is why I put the social emotional piece in there. Uh, you know, and of course, I do that with my boy as well. Um, but this will not be an excuse for you but to, to get the PlayStation out, <laughs> the head to the wall, talk with the boys, and you all know what's the game they play all the time now? <laughs> uh, Fortnite. This is not Fortnite time, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and, but my larger point was that there should be some kind of guidance from the district. And I don't know why I expect this from the district, because I don't think they have the capacity to do it. I just don't think they have. There's certain things the district is very competent in, and there's certain things they're incompetent. I think communication is something they're very competent in, in terms of what, how they like to spin a message and make themselves look good. I think educating children, uh, I think the professional development of the adults who teach the children, I think this district is completely incompetent uh, in that arena. So I don't know why I would even express uh, any, uh, uh, any kind of being upset at the fact that they haven't done this because I don't think they're capable of doing it. That said, it still has to be addressed. There still needs to be some kind of leadership that principals can turn to, even if it's just ourselves and each other, to look at best practices. And so that's the kind of thing that sort of we're turning towards as we shift from having to defend principals' health and safety, which hopefully we, 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 we were able to pivot and actually provide some kind of uh, academic, instructional, social, emotional leadership for them to provide to their teachers so their teachers can give it to their students. You know, Troy, I hope that made you. listening to you riff about uh, <laughs> your uh, exchanges with your 12 year old son brought me back to when uh, to my days <laughs> when I, I I'm kind of with your son a little just to a degree. I could see where he's coming from, because when I was about 12, we, I, obviously it was the ancient days. We didn't have com computer games, but I was obsessed with sports. If any sport was on TV, I'd be watching. I watch wrestling. I watch roller derby. I watch <laughs> track, tennis, right. basketball. If it was on, and my dad would come in, I'd be watching the boob tube. He goes, it's a beautiful day. You should be out walking. Your brain is a muscle if you don't use it. it and I'm like, Dad, could you move over? This is like, this is an incredible wrestling match going on here. And so this is a struggle that will always exist. You know, you grow up, you gr suddenly I turned into my father when I was dealing with my kids, you know what I'm saying? And <laughs> didn't appreciate. I lost track of the 12-year-old who just wanted to watch wrestling and roller derby. So I can kind of relate to your son at the same time I've been in where you are. Do you follow what I'm saying? Uh, I feel you, man. It's a balance, man. I mean, I don't cut the PlayStation off. I mean, he gets his time in. Um, I'm just trying to create some kind of balance. I had him watching the other day uh, The Civil War by Ken Burns. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ken Burns film. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's an amazing film. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nine-part documentary. Um, and we finally got, we got to watch. We've been watching him on his own and taking notes, but sat down and watched one episode with him. Um, and after we finished, we were, we were discussing it and talking it through. It was like, this was the best one yet. Like, you know, so giving him not just sort of the, he has to watch it not just for facts and figures, because I saw him taking notes on, you know, 
who won this battle and what happened in that battle. I'm like, you're not getting quizzed on the Battle of Chattanooga, son. <laughs> I want you to identify. I want you to identify some themes here. You know, some, some underlying themes here that you will find not only in the Civil War, but you also find in the Vietnam War. I want you to find some life lessons here. So we, it's been a good experience. And then after that, we played Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <laughs> which is the equivalent of me watching roller derby back in 1971 exactly. or whatever. Uh, all right, so uh, on a more serious front, the uh, stoppage of school has, of course, and you know this uh, as well as anyone, Troy, just exacerbated the disadvantages that so many poor kids in the city of Chicago have uh, in contrast to their wealthier peers in the wealthier neighborhoods of Chicago. Uh, like the one that you used to be a principal in, in the wealthier suburbs around Chicago. Uh, you know, I've, I've always felt that our public schools, it, it's an enormous responsibility they're given to somehow or other uh, figure out how to make sure kids from the poorest backgrounds uh, are learning at the same pace as kids from the wealthier backgrounds who have all the advantages that wealth uh, gives to them in in like a tutor hire a tutor the kids struggling in math bring in a tutor that kind of thing um mm -hmm. obviously if you cut all kids off from school it's just going to uh make that gap greater do you follow what i'm saying it's just going to make that challenge even more difficult to manage um i mean you know i agree i would only add that you know, the focus, and this kind of reminds me of the healthcare situation too, but we'll get to that. Um, you know, the focus has been on the technology divide. Right? That's, that's been the focus, that rich kids will have this, poor kids, but that, that kid who's in a low-income house will also be in a house that's more likely to have lead paint in the walls, right? What are you going to do about that? Oh, you're going to give every kid, you know, a laptop. Wonderful. That's great. To start, what are we as a city going to do about the fact that if a kid lives in uh, Lincoln Park or Lakeview, his chances of being exposed to lead paint are nearly zero. But if that kid lives in North Mondale or Austin, then the chances that he or she will be exposed to lead paint are one in four, right? And that's always been the case, and it's always been impacting their academic attainment, always having an impact on their brain development, and this city does virtually nothing about it. Um, and so I think that the conversation about online access and this coronavirus or school closing heightening awareness of that divide needs to refocus awareness on the divides that will always there and will always be there even when we go back to school. Um, like the fact that that tutor you talked about, that parent is less likely to be able to afford them because they don't have the kind of job uh, or have, make the kind of income that will get them that tutor. So um, that's all I would add. But yeah, in general, of course, uh, there aren't too many things that you and I uh, we don't disagree on that. One, I'll say that. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I, I just sort of shake my head. I mean, it is an overwhelming problem, but I see articles in the paper about distributing computers uh, as though that is going to in any way. That's like putting a band aid. I don't even. It's a band aid on this gaping wound. And then if this pandemic passes, and I hope it does. Troy, oh man, I I know I sound so fatalistic. We go right back to where we were. Do you get what I'm saying? And we just go right back to where we were. Poor kids in these schools, wealthier kids in these schools. The poor schools are struggling. Teachers had to go on strike to get some nurses uh, committed in the contract. It's just like we never seem to learn. But then, you know, lip service at a time of crisis. So I'm trying not to be... Uh, completely and utterly uh, fatalistic as I have this conversation with you. Uh, but it's hard not to, Troy. Well, well, of course we go back to where we were, but what is where we were? Because in my head, right, where we were was a fight, right? That's where we were. Where we were was a struggle. And so we're either going to leave this crisis better 
prepared and better armed to move that struggle forward or less prepared and less armed? That's, I think, the way we have to think about it because during any crisis, there are always people on the side of those who have more than they can use in their entire lives who will think about ways to use this crisis as a way to further their interests. And then those of us who sometimes don't have enough to last until the end of the month have to think about a way, way uh, and means to use this crisis to further our interests, the interests of the majority, the 99.999%. Um, so absolutely, we got to go back to where we were, but where we were is always in motion. There's always a struggle. There's always a fight. How are we going to use this to further the fight? And we certainly have a lot of messaging weapons now that we didn't have before, a lot of um, things that we can bring into the struggle for health care for all, for example. Like this, this pandemic is making the necessity for a program like Medicare for all or single payer uh, kind of like a no-brainer, even though most Democratic politicians aren't treating it like it's a no-brainer. All right, we, but we still that, have the weapons. I will get to that. I have to ask you one last thing before I go, make the leap to national because healthcare for all. I want to get to that. That was uh, Bernie Sanders' great theme that he articulated throughout uh, the 2016 election and not this one. And the Democratic voters essentially said that's too unrealistic. So we'll get to that. Uh, let, let me t ask you about this headline that I'm looking at right now in front of me from today's Sun-Times. There's a similar one in the Tribune. A deadly divide. 70% of Chicago's virus victims are African-American. And th that's the headline in the Sun-Times. Tribune headline, Chicago's disparity. St statistics show disadvantaged communities hit harder. Blacks have died at nearly six times the rate as whites. When you see these headlines, Troy, when you, when you read these news stories, what thoughts pop to your mind? Um, well, I think anybody who paid attention to the health statistics for black people wouldn't be surprised. Anyone who's paid attention to the health statistics for black people and paid attention to the comorbidity conversation going on around the coronavirus, where you are more likely to die from this if you have a, uh, what they call a comorbid condition, a high-risk condition, if you're in a vulnerable population, if you have diabetes. Uh, if you have diabetes, that's one of those conditions. And then you also know that black people are more likely to have diabetes than you know they're high risk group. High blood pressure. I grew up my entire life hearing about high blood pressure in my family. Like, I got to take my blood pressure pills. You're going to get your blood pressure. Like, that's just the thing for us. You know, I'm one of the few black people I know who, who's never had high blood pressure. But I also know, again, and I'm rare, I think over half of us, uh, at this point right now, have, have high blood pressure. I think it's 48%. So if you know that high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, you know, as a, and then with, the, with the asthma, I mean, we really have to think about environmental conditions in black neighborhoods and polluters that contribute to the high asthma rates, which are now also contributing to the high death rates for the coronavirus when you combine those two things together. Um, so I'm not surprised. Um, and again, it's another tool if we choose to use it as a tool to point out just how unjust the current social and economic order is, how it makes no sense, how it's irrational, how at the end of the day it can hurt us all because the more black people who end up with this, the more you can, you know, the more people, period, who end up with it, the more people who can spread. Um, so that's my initial response. Does that answer your question, brother, or do you have a follow-up? No, I have a, a follow-up that attached to what I was talking, what you were talking about before I made you go on that uh, tangent, and that is this. Uh, you talk about uh, all these existing conditions that uh, the virus and the pandemic are exacerbating. Uh, and then I'm thinking back to a conversation I heard uh, last week I talked about it a lot on the show. Bernie Sanders, who you supported in 2016, uh, was on The View. And he was asked by one of the hosts on The View, I, I still can't get over this, uh, Troy. And she said, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, that in times of crises, 
we should all come together uh, as one country. And uh, you, Bernie, should not be using this crisis uh, as a, an excuse to um, get Medicare for all passed. And I, I, I that just, there's so many, <laughs> I, I couldn't even like, I can't even get the sentence out, Troy. I'm just, even now, I'm so outraged by it. And this woman who asked the question, I think was one of the more liberal ones of the view. And this just shows the mindset of Democrats. It's like, this crisis shows why we need health care for all. You get what? It's not like, oh, wow, I'm going to get something out of this crisis that's bad for people. No, I'm. It's a realization moment for America. We need insurance. We need we need to allow people to get health care if they need it. It just seems as though Absolutely. the mindset of Democrats is still all screwed up, Troy. Uh, I mean, it's like if you're walking around and bricks are being thrown everywhere and you tell someone you shouldn't be using this brick throwing as an excuse to run around telling people to duck. <laughs> Like what else do you do? What else? What else am I? What What else am I going to? Do you have another solution? There's this wonderful piece, and in, in these times, um, I just happen to be promoting in these times today too. <laughs> There's a wonderful piece in, in these times um, this week called, uh, and I don't remember the exact title. I'm paraphrasing. It's something like, if you're not, if you're a Democrat and you're not for Medicare for all by now, then Go ahead and join. Then just go ahead and join the Republican Party. Uh, and it starts off with this line about this brick throwing. And he says, it talks about physics. It says, sometimes things that are very complex in a crisis get very simple. Um, let's say physics, for example. It's a very complex thing. But if someone throws a brick at you, you duck. <laughs> because you understand physics at a basic level. And he says, Medicare for all and providing health care to everyone who needs it is a complex endeavor. But when you have a virus that's infecting thousands of people and millions, that's killing thousands of people, and then millions of people who are, are losing their jobs, which are tied to their health insurance, and then it becomes a very simple endeavor to say, we need Medicare for all. We need to have a system that gives everyone health care at no cost. It's a no-brainer at that point. Um, but we don't live in a culture or in a society or an economic order where the people who benefit from that order want that to be a, a no-brainer, where the politicians whose campaigns are funded by the people who benefit from that order can easily shift, you know, they can see the logic, but they can also see the, the purse strings. And the purse strings that fund their campaigns that they are sort of pledged their loyalty to, you know, won't tolerate that shift to supporting something like Medicare for All because it would be the end of their business model. Well, and, and then you have to take into consideration the attitude of voters. You're You're talking about maybe let's say the Joe Bidens of the world uh, who don't want to upset the apple cart because they're connected to these industries. You're talking about politicians whose behavior uh, is controlled to a degree by the people who give them the money that they take. What about the voters? I struggle with this one, Troy. Help me out here now. The voters, 70% of the voters uh, in the Democratic primaries, roughly maybe 65%, uh, have said they don't want Bernie Sanders. Uh, they they feel he's a losing candidate. He will automatically lose to Donald Trump. They've made this decision. They've made it clear in state after state uh, since uh, New Hampshire and Iowa. Uh, many of them are black voters who are making this decision. Uh, and they feel that Joe Biden is uh, more electable, so they're going to go with Joe Biden. And if that means sacrificing Medicare for all, so be it. I, I'm really struggling with, with the voters they're not on the health, they're not on the payroll of the insurance company. Do you follow what I'm saying? They're not getting donations from the insurance company. Most of them have a terrible insurance that they can't stand. And yet Yeah. They, you bring up a different issue. It's related, but it's different. That like not a lot of people vote their issues, unfortunately. Like the nuances of issues. 
Um, again, like you said, they would sacrifice Medicare for all because 70% of the voters certainly are not against Medicare for all. So this is not a question about whether you are or are not for Medicare for all. This is a question about who you've been convinced can win, who you've been convinced can be Trump. Um, and I mean, these are the same people who were convinced Hillary could win. And we see how that turned out. And now they've given us uh, meandering Joe Biden <laughs> as a candidate. Uh, I mean, just think about this. Trump's approval rate, as he has fumbled through this and just one disaster after another went up. I mean, it finally started to take this last few days, but they actually went up. Right? That is a direct indictment on the failure of Joe Biden. Can you imagine if Bernie Sanders was the expected Democratic nominee, how he, like Trump would not be able to get away. The reason Biden can't effectively counter Trump or show Trump's inconsistencies or his absurdities is that he doesn't have much of an alternative. How can you go against Trump when you also don't believe in Medicare for all and neither does he? Right? We've decided to put somebody up whose policies are not radically different from Trump. And as a result, they can't put themselves up as a contrast to Trump. And we get Trump's approval ratings going through the roof, or not through the roof, well, through the roof for him, um, as a result of Joe Biden's ineffectiveness and the lack of, I don't know, prudent decision making on the part of many voters. Yeah, I uh, that's well put. And uh, I listen. I urge. My attitude is that the Democrats should not. The Democratic leadership should step in. They should have an intervention and uh, request Joe Biden to step down. I think he's he's not he's not the person you want leading the party. And I have to tell you, uh, Troy, I've been look, reflecting on the debates. We spent all the time talking about the debates going back to last summer. There are about four candidates that I could see would do a better job just on, from that stage of representing the Democrats uh, at this time, more uh, forcefully confronting Donald Trump, uh, having a, a stronger articulation of what they believe in uh, than Trump, and willing just to say, you know what, I was wrong about my – this is something else. Just, just say you're wrong. Joe Biden could right now say, you know what, this crisis has woken me up. I was wrong to be against Medicare for all. Now I'm for it. I, I would welcome something like that from the Democrats uh, to intervene at this moment because I don't believe uh, that Joe Biden is the best person to uh, take this fight into November. I really don't. Yeah, I like what you said about a stronger articulation of what he believes. I, I think that hits the heart of a lot of it that he cannot articulate a vision. He cannot articulate, we're talking about Biden here, a set of policies that will get us to that vision that stands anywhere near. And in order to be a contrast to someone, you have to paint the picture. You know, if you can't paint the picture, if you can't paint it forcefully and vividly, you will not stand out. You will not present, people will not see what you are, what you stand for. Yeah. I... And Biden has been completely, amazing. Biden has been completely unable to do that. And so I think you hit it on the head when you said that he has failed to forcefully articulate. I mean, he, he in these conversations with, uh, you know, the, when, he, when, he, when he's in these interviews, he's always saying, check my webpage. You know, <laughs> Look at my webpage. Check yeah. out my seven thousand page. Check out my seven thousand page. It's in the book. You don't even know <laughs> your own proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine Bernie <laughs> like that? Bernie or any of the other nominees? Uh, excuse me, not nominees, candidates. Yeah. Uh, anybody but Biden. And I think again, you, I'm just repeating what you said in different words. You said just about you. You know at least four other candidates who will be doing a better job uh, in this crisis and against Trump than Biden. 
I agree with you there, and I agree with you on that point that you hit, that they could forcefully and uh, with strength articulate um, a vision and yeah. some policy. Absolutely. And that's just four from the that I'm doing off the top of my head. I think Cory Booker could do a better job than Joe Biden. I think Kamala Harris could do a better job uh, than Joe Biden. I think Jay Inslee, who at one point was running for president, I don't know if you remember that, he's the governor of Washington, he could do a better job uh, than Joe Biden. I'm just, those are three that just popped off right off the... Elizabeth Warren could do a better job uh, than Joe Biden. And I'm not even putting Bernie on the list. I voted for Bernie. See, here's the thing, Troy. I don't know if you deal with... Uh, I call them Biden bros. They love Joe Biden immensely. And I deal with them all. No, I, don't deal with them. I didn't know they existed. Oh, they exist. I wrote a couple critical articles about Joe Biden. They were crying like babies. Ugh, leave Joe alone. You're so mean to Joe. And so, you know, they talk about Bernie being sensitive, Bernie's supporters being sensitive. Man. Uh, but, you know, so they always say, you're just, uh, you know, a sour grape Bernie supporter. And I'm like, I'm not even talking about Bernie. I recognize that 70% of the party, 65% of the party didn't want Bernie Sanders. For whatever reason, he scares them. That they, they should probably go to a therapist to see why he scares them, but that's a whole other issue. So I'm just taking other candidates. I, like uh, Andrew Cuomo in New York. Troy, I've, I've followed Andrew Cuomo's career. I pro he's like a mini Rom, you know, uh, or maybe Rom's a mini Cuomo. They're very similar in the way they view the world until this crisis. At this moment, I would take Cuomo in a heartbeat over Joe Biden. Why? Because he can put a sentence together in a reassuring way that shows that he understands the crisis we're facing, and he could deal with it, in, a, in my op opinion, in a realistic way. I would take him. So he wasn't even a candidate. I would take J.B. Pritzker. You must feel the same way when you go down, when you see the reactions that various politicians have to this moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we could go on a tangent on Prisca. I, you know, I, I wasn't for Prisca when he was running, but and I'm still not a cheerleader, but I've been very happy with what he's done so far. Um, but uh, again, I, and that's one thing I, I take issue with how you frame 70% of the people didn't want to burn it. Um, I think that many of the folks who did not vote for Bernie, if you look at exit polls, Bernie was their second or third choice. And so it's not like there's just this outright rejection. I think Warren's presence in the, uh, and not that she shouldn't have run, but her presence just hurt him. It just did um, in terms of those results. Uh, I would imagine that if we were to take that question and say, who actually did not want Bernie, um, I would imagine the result, the number would be far lower. You know, he wasn't the first choice of 70%, but I would not say the 70% was scared of Bernie or 70 to hell. I had most of the people who voted for Joe, Joe Biden himself their second choice. <laughs> That's fair enough. All right, uh, I'm going to close on this uh, conversation by going in a completely different direction. Uh, and there's a generational sure. gap between Troy and myself. I am uh, I'm at least 20 years older than Troy, I want to say, anyway. Uh, <laughs> at, at least. Uh, more, but the, there's something, Troy, I never shared with you. That would make you 69, man. Oh, no. Okay, I'm not 20. Okay, less than 20 years. God, you're you're older than I get. That's something I have you still in your 30s. Uh, anyway, uh, so I met Troy. I've told this story a few times. I met Troy uh, after he wrote an op-ed piece in the Sun-Times where he criticized the powers that be in the city of Chicago. I couldn't believe that a principal would actually do that. I called him up. We didn't have coffee together. We ended up talking for like two and a half hours at this coffee shop. And And... Troy told me the story of his life and, you know, how you weren't the best. That I kind of resonated with me. You weren't the, the best of all scholars in high school uh, and that uh, you went to, I think it was the Navy. Did you join the Navy? That's Navy. Right. Yeah. And, right. and I thought this, Troy, I never shared this with you, but you kind of reminded me of Bill Withers and he just passed. And I've been really, wow. uh, 
thinking about Bill Withers a lot lately. He's been on my mind because I, I just love Bill Withers back in the day. I loved his music. I listened to it all the time. And I find myself listening to it. Uh, so he's one, one of the five. Whenever I'm doing the dishes during this moment of quarantine, he, there's like certain artists I go back to because I find them <laughs> reassuring. You know, and Stevie Wonder, I listen to him all the time. Uh, Curtis Mayfield. Bill Withers, but there was something about your story and Bill Withers. I don't know if anybody ever told you this. Bill Withers, too, was not a great scholar in high school. Bill Withers, too, went to uh, the military, and then he found his way, uh, and he fell in love with books on his own, became, like, self-educated. And I always, uh -huh. there's something about you and Bill Withers that always, <laughs> and I know, I wish I had told you that at the time, because then I'd be like, you know, it would really mean something now, but Anyway, that's when I, I just had to share that with you. Uh, I've been thinking about you in connection to Bill Withers. Uh, have you do, you? do you have any thoughts about Bill Withers? Uh, are you a fan? Were you even aware of him, or is it just a generational thing? So well, number one, that is that is a high compliment. Uh, you have never told me that. No one's ever told me that. Oh, yes, I am a fan. I was just listening to uh, "Hello Like Before." Uh, in the kitchen the other day and thinking of just how incredible that man's lyrics are. Uh, simple and incredible. Um, grandma's hand. But she says she sued the local unwed mother. Like, who puts that in the lyric? <laughs> uh, was just maybe two days ago, um, was listening to him thinking about how much of a genius he, he is. So, uh, no, I haven't thought about that. I consider it high praise and I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's a similar. I mean, not, look, you and Bill Withers are not the only people who struggle in school and found their way by going to like, you know, taking time off to join the Navy or the Army, you know. Uh, but uh, I remember when you tell me that story from the Navy, you went to University of Illinois and you, uh, you just I guess you discovered your love for books and one thing led to the other and became a teacher and a principal. Uh, anyway, I just had to share that with you. Uh, Troy LaRabier and Bill Withers separated at birth. Um, Troy, thanks so much again for taking time. I, I really enjoy talking politics with you, whether we're in the studio together or over the phone, whether it's a healthy times or virus times. Keep yourself safe. And uh, I'm with your son, kind of with your son in that argument, okay? I'm just a little bit with your son. Uh, <laughs> but you got to do, you got to think. Take care, Troy. Good talking to you. That's the great Troy right, LaRabier. Uh, president of the Chicago Principals Association. It's true, D. When I met him many years ago, I was like, kind of reminds me of Bill Withers. <laughs> so, I don't know. Wish I, I didn't see that one coming. I uh, know. I but I thought about that this weekend. I was thinking about it. Well. I've spent a lot of time, folks, uh, as I walk down the street uh, doing social distancing, D. All right? Let me just tell you that right now. Uh-oh. I'm online right now. I see that sign language guy hustling. <laughs> J.B. Pritzker's uh, we taking the podium. Oh, uh, the, <laughs> the sign language guy is a harder work. So we're going to uh, close down the show. Uh, uh, young Dr. D is going to uh, upload it. Isn't that the terminology you used, D? You're getting there. Hey, what are these things on our head right now? Buckets. Oh, okay, they're uh, called cans. Oh, sorry. You're uh, embarrassing. And then we're going to interview uh, Maya. We'll drop that uh, later in the evening so be uh, on the listen out for that all right but uh what are we nine o'clock tonight yeah eight o'clock nine nine, eight. nine nine come on nine we, we just had another show meeting yeah, right show there. meeting pre-show this is post-show anyway uh, uh, i want to thank uh, troy larabier for taking time to talk to us and of course the man the myth the legend the pride of joy at alton illinois back home in alton you know what they call him everybody White Lightning. Yes, indeed. They call him White. Even the mayor of Alton calls him White Lightning. Oh, I, I, did you see that guy in his hair? He's White Lightning. Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody. Hey, and remember, you can download previous Ben Jarofsky shows and this weekend's Benny J bonus interviews at both Chicago Sun-Times and Chicago Reader websites and wherever else you download your favorite podcast. If you live in Logan Square, my God, you'll love this Bob Dylan special that Ben and McDumpkey did. <laughs> Hipsters will love it. Hipster approved. Go check it out, everybody. Chicago Sun-Times at Chicago Reader websites. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow.
I'm yeah. not a perfect person. That's correct. <laughs>